Hey, friends. Welcome to a very special episode of Property Pursuits. But I do have to apologize because there will be probably more reading today than usual because we didn't want to assume the results or how the market would react because there was a lot of like anticipation. Mm-hmm. And so some of the stuff we're telling you, we've literally thrown together this morning in response. And so I, for one, will definitely be reading more of my notes than usual. But in a very historic election, America spoke quite loudly. And we don't have the results of all the local elections yet, but it's almost certain that the Republicans will control the White House and Congress. And we already have a conservative Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. So let's talk. Let's get right into specifics on the impacts that we've seen already and then some that we're anticipating. You guys probably know the stock market was soaring. It hit a high we haven't seen in two years almost, 1,300 points this morning. Um, And a big part of this was just that there was a clear answer right away. The market Mm -hmm. likes that. Markets don't like uncertainty, and they've been very tightly wound up. Like you could feel the tension in the market leading up to Election Day because they were assuming that this was going to be a long, dramatic, drawn-out process. And simply the fact that it wasn't has been good for financial markets. Um, of course, the mark, a red wave across the board is also a signal to the markets for more deregulation and tax-friendly policies, um, specifically at the corporate level. So they like that. But then I wanted to dive a little bit deeper, and I looked at historical figures, and it seems that stocks boom after an election regardless of which party wins, because we now have clarity on what the next four years will look like. Yep. The S&P has grown on average 10% under Democratic presidents versus 6.7% under Republicans. GDP, the broadest measure of the economy, has averaged 3.9% under Democrats and 2.4% under Republicans. So given those stats, historically, my best guess is simply the market had their panties in a wad and was freaking out uh, that that we would be in a long drawn out. This could take weeks, months Mm -hmm. into next year before we would have an answer. And the fact that we don't um, and that it was a business friendly president has been met with enthusiasm. Yep. For stocks anyway. So we're going to, yeah, for stocks. We're getting into the next part. But we'll see if that enthusiasm lasts. So definitely rough news for bonds this morning as interest rates um, are not reacting well. But it's not as bad as what we saw in 2016 when Trump's victory really shocked the markets. We were in a rough spot for months. That's before your time, isn't it? Uh, 2016, yeah. Sandy probably had normal nice days after that. We had a very rough (laughs) few months where things were really painful because we just didn't think it was going to have that kind of impact on mortgage rates, and it lasted for months that we got hosed. I was hoping for some more confusion because when the bond market sees confusion, they're like, oh, great, we'll pull our money from stocks and put it in bonds. We'll pull our money from stocks and put it in bonds Um, because bonds are seen as a long-term safe investment. And so when there's confusion, I was like, oh, great, rates will get better. And then it was just super quick and quite clear, quite clear. And we didn't have that rally for bonds. You're not supposed to admit that we hope for bad news sometimes. (laughs) Um, So in 2016, the pain was pretty severe and it lasted a while. We actually saw the markets prepare for a Trump victory starting last week. We saw interest rates go up half a point, and we saw money move. That's why we were saying that the bond market has already declared a Trump victory last week, well ahead of the election, because we saw money moving out of bonds and into gold and Bitcoin, which is also soaring this morning. Bitcoin is at like 20, 74000 this morning. It's, it's doing really well. Um, but I'll explain why money moves out of Treasury bonds in anticipation of a Trump victory in a second. The moves from investors last week, moving their money out of them, caused interest rates to go up half a point. This morning, the Treasury rose to 4.47%. That's the highest since July. So you can watch the 10-year note, and you'll get an idea of what's going to happen with mortgage rates. So you can even watch this overnight. When the 10-year is up, mortgage rates are getting worse. Um, So now let me explain why bonds don't like a Trump presidency. And it's actually really, really simple, especially if you've been watching this for a while. Trump is inflationary. His tariffs and immigration reform result in higher costs of goods and services, which is the mortal enemy of mortgage interest rates. His tax cuts increase the national debt by an estimated five to ten trillion over the next decade, which puts the Fed in a tricky position to cut rates even if the economy is slowing down. It's basically a toxic mix for fixed income assets, bonds. So in my blog, two 
two weeks ago, I broke down the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act because I have been, Sandy's sick of hearing about it now, I've been like on, <laughs> I've been obsessed with the tax code for the past 18 months and the impact it has on everyone from wage earners to self-employed to corporations. And so if you're interested in the tax code and how, what we can expect to happen, because the Tax Cut and Jobs Act that Trump enacted in 2017 had major tax policy. And this was a big part of the election this time because it will sunset next year. So whichever president mm -hmm. is, so now we know Trump will be in office and he will need to work with Congress to extend those tax cuts. Yeah, and it's important for you guys to know that because it directly impacts your finances. So, I mean, you hear of tax cuts, I think a lot of times, and it seems like this like far off concept. Or something that only affects the ultra rich. Yeah. But there are ways, especially with real estate, that you can utilize this to really better your family's financial future. Um, so it's just important for everyone to know how they can play this tax game. The tax code is a contract that every U.S. citizen signs with the government that nobody understands. And I think you should. I think you should spend some time understanding it because I think it would change your perspective on your finances. So if the demand for mortgage bonds is shrinking, I want to make sure this is really clear. When the, there's a lot of demand for mortgage bonds, when investors think that they can get a better return on their money in bonds, then mortgage interest rates improve. When there's less demand for bonds, mortgage interest rates get worse. And in inflationary times, there's less demand for bonds. In times of certainty, there's less demand for bonds. So investors will move their money into Bitcoin or the stock exchange, other vehicles of investment, and we'll see interest rates shoot up. Hopefully what we're seeing right now today is going to be shorter lived than what we saw in 2016. And of course, all eyes will be on the Fed tomorrow, because like I said, this is a bit of a toxic cocktail that they're in and that if they proceed with their planned cut, knowing that upcoming policy is very inflationary, they kind of have their back against the wall. There's a Fed mole who publishes a blog about this. He says they're going to cut tomorrow 25 basis points, which will be relief that we're looking for. Um, but the cuts for next year are at risk because of the trajectory of inflation. So because we know, so let's, let's like relate this to housing specifically because there's a million implications of the election, right? But mm -hmm. today what we're gonna talk about is housing, the real estate market. Does it go back to normal? And I think it does because I think the truth is the economy, interest rates, home prices, they don't motivate people to move. What motivates people to move are the three Ds, death, diapers, divorce. And people will move regardless of what's happening with the economy. Yeah. And history has shown this is true. <clears throat> home sales improve after elections. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the 48% of buyers who have been on hold are probably going to be like, oh, okay, the world kept spinning. Which we've been I'm telling you. I'm getting married, would. so let's just buy a house. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Trump, and, Trump has made some promises. He is, you know... A real estate investor, a real estate tycoon. So he had some very specific promises when it came to housing. Trump and Vance have promised the largest deportation operation in American history, which they believe will decrease the demand for housing and then reduce prices. Take a lot of buyers out of the pool. There's more inventory for the buyers that remain. Realtor.com's senior economist, Ralph McLaughlin, thinks this sort of operation would, at least in the short run, have negative impacts because the reduced labor supply for new construction in the country, which is currently short. I always say 4.5 million homes, but I saw a stat this morning that said between three and 7.2 million homes. Yeah, short. It's, it's a, I think the general consensus is right around four though. So we're short, and if we reduce the labor supply to build new homes, that could impact the prices. Currently one third of the residential construction employment labor market is foreign born. Lending Tree, senior economist Jacob Channel writes that mass deportations could cause serious economic fallout that would be catastrophic for the nation's broader economy. So this is something we're going to watch going forward, right? I always tell you guys to watch the Fed's dual mandate, which is inflation and the jobs market. This is part of the jobs market that you're going to watch now if you want to watch home prices. But our favorite thing as a country, we found out last night about Trump, is that he speaks in hyperbole. So we shouldn't necessarily assume that the largest deportation operation in American history actually means a mass deportation. Trump has promised deregulation on housing permits. You guys know how I feel about housing. More housing benefits all housing. And if we incentivize developers to build, that helps. So we have to reduce the burdens on them and make it easier. Any developer will tell you the city does not make it easy to build 
And I think that would apply to almost every city out there. So deregulation of this could be helpful in reducing home prices if developers can build more. Trump explained that regulation costs up to 30% of a new home's sales price. And that's terrible because cities should not be putting that kind of burden on home builders in a nation where the demand for housing is so desperate. The National Association of Home Builders has also been a long-standing critic of this, which makes sense. They're not going to like high building costs and cities making it hard. Um, they actually, their chair congratulated Trump this morning on his win, but they said the work and related permit um, actually only costs about 7.4% of a new home's cost. He has also promised to lower mortgage interest rates, which we're here for all day Yeah, we long. are. Let's do it. He hasn't given a plan, but last time he was president, he pressured the Fed to cut their rate to zero and hold it there for a long time. Interest rates were at 2 to 3%, which was pretty awesome for affordability until home prices started jumping rapidly. Mark Zandi, chief economist of Moody's Analytics, tweeted, and this is a quote, Investors are taking Trump at his word. His plans, to, his plans will lead to higher tariffs, immigration deportations, and deficit finance tax cuts in a full employment economy, all of which means higher inflation and more government borrowing. So this is what we're going to watch for, guys. We're going to watch, does the Fed continue with their trajectory of cutting interest rates? Do Trump's promises materialize into inflationary policy? And that will help you to keep a pulse on where interest rates are hidden. Or headed, sorry, not hidden. They're not hidden any time of the day for me. They are always quite apparent. You don't have to wait for this monthly webinar to catch up with us. Uh, you can find us online. We put out a lot of content all the time, much of it not really politically focused. Today's different for us. We want to really only talk about politics as it affects bonds and interest rates in the real estate market. The rest of our content is super educational on real estate and finances, house hacking, money hacking, a lot of it. We want you to win. So follow us on Instagram so that we can help you win. Okay, so we wanted to talk about, okay, you got the up market update on what's going on. So what is the current opportunity in the market? It's to act when other people are frozen. So 40% of home buyers took a pause before the election, and now it's over. And I personally think that a lot of people are still going to be like, oh, well, let's just maybe wait and see like when he comes into office, like what that looks like. And we know like one of the best times to get a deal is when you have less competition. So if you can get out there and negotiate a really stellar deal. That could be price reduction, seller credits, get repairs. We've seen inventory become a slightly more balanced market recently, right? Like COVID, we were in a crazy seller's market and then rates spiked and we felt like we were in more of a buyer's market. I would say now is like somewhere in the middle, but buyers are definitely still getting really good deals for the ones that are actively out there. When we do a pre-approval with a buyer, we run the data in the zip code they're shopping for days on market. and. Most of the time it's like, well, I mean, during the pandemic, it was like two weeks, days on market. And it's always feels less than the data says. Like mm -hmm. it feels like homes are going faster. When they say 14 days, we're like, I would love to see a listing sit 14 days. But it's an average, you know, of the whole zip code. Right now, when I've been running that, it's been saying over 100 days on market, which mm -hmm. is the highest I've seen in a long time. Yeah. So and that's in a buyer's favor. Yeah. Right. If you're if you have a seller who has to move and then you come in and you're the only offer. Or and I would argue if a, a listing is up right now. In the midst of all this, that's a motivated seller. They need to sell mm -hmm. that house. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because a lot of sellers are also like, man, let's just wait and see what happens. So those people probably have to move. Even outside of election years, houses on the market at the end of the year, yeah. it's not an optimal time to get the most money for your house. Your realtor would advise you to list it in the spring. Mm -hmm. So if you're listed right now, you've got a reason you need to sell, and our buyers out there need to pay attention to that. Yeah. So then we can talk about, like, right, housing affordability has also been kind of an an um obstacle. So, so, you know, we have strategies that can help with that. And this is where it gets very personalized. So, so fill out your application, have a plan. Like this is the, the general advice, but it still applies in a post election market is, is know your plan, know your goals, put, put together a creative strategy. Are we doing a co-signer? Are we getting a buy down to increase your affordability? Like what is the, what is the plan? The temporary buy downs have still been huge, um, especially in a rate, you know, we're expecting the long-term rates to probably continue coming down, and that's where you can get a refund of potential temporary buy-down credit that you negotiate from the seller right now because they're motivated. Um, I wouldn't continue waiting for a tax credit. So 
if you do have that wait and see mentality, like historically, those who have waited for some campaign promise to materialize have not come out ahead because they're missing out on so much time where their home could be going up in value, where they're capitalizing on the tax benefits that Shawani was talking about, um, where they're paying down their mortgage, where they're watching for a refinance opportunity. So there's just, um, yes, we might see some changes with, with housing and the things that we were talking about, but um, historically housing always goes up over time. So if that's a goal for you and your wealth building strategy, let's at least start the conversation now. I like it. Okay, so tips for buyers. So pick a good lender. We were just talking about creative strategies and that's really important right now is having a lender who can look at your specific scenario. Know that there are plenty of programs available now to help with down payment, all kinds of things. So there are strategies and if you have a good lender who's creative at putting together a strategy, um, that's huge. Watch for new policies. We've been talking a little bit about um, creative qualifying and there's been some other discussions about tips no longer being tax taxable income. So then there's discussion around the office about, oh, how does that work in terms of waiters and you know any other people who get tip income, are they now unable to use that to qualify? Because historically, if you don't report tips on your tax returns, that's not money we can use to get you a house. But if you do report them, you're being taxed on them. Uh, yeah, and which can be a pretty dramatic tax liability. So then there's some strategy around, okay, how do we be strategic about that in the year or two before buying a house? Um, so the thing is here, like... But if they don't tax the tips, if this... both Trump has promised this. He wants to not tax tips. Yeah. Harris had too. If that works out, it doesn't actually change anything. You still need to claim the tips. You just won't be taxed on them. But That's we still need I'm to see thinking, them on yeah. your pay stub. Yeah, well, but then the cash tips... Do those go on the pay stub? Well, we rarely get to use cash. I mean, I'm talking about in practice, not in theory. Yeah. We rarely get to use people's cash tips because they're not claiming those. Right. They're claiming the tips they're getting in credit cards. Yeah. And now those wouldn't be taxed and it wouldn't change anything in what you report to us. So it could be a pretty big win. Yeah. But I'm thinking too, like the cash tips, right? Because previously you wouldn't really report those probably. Oh, you're saying they will report them now because they're not being... Yeah. That's what I'm curious about because they either... I mean, if it's that's even no, if it's non-taxable income, it, that doesn't mean that we can't use it. Is like kind of where I'm going with this. So we would just have to like prove it exists, I'm sure, and then mortgage guidelines might have to catch up. But I, don't I think, think they'll that's claim it. They'll about. claim it like they claim the credit card tips, and then. it just won't increase their total total taxable income. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. It's yeah. true. If you talk to your lender, we're going to advise you to claim your tips. And hopefully that will not hurt you taxes wise if this policy comes to fruition. Mm -hmm. And then you're right. I, I always am sitting there wishing I had cash. Like when I take my kids to Baskin Robbins, mm -hmm. that poor woman who scoops their ice cream, <laughs> when they ask to taste like three different things and they talk over each other and they get so excited. And then I go to pay with my credit card and then you, it doesn't let you tip. And every week uh, on Tuesday, I'm like, why don't I remember to bring cash to tip this woman? Yeah. I know it's hard these days, but I could be better at it too. <laughs> Um, okay. Yeah. So I think that will be, honestly, if the tax tips become non-taxable, that would be great. Um, keep shopping, keep looking. Things are, and this is again, my standard advice is if you can be looking, but not in a pressured situation, that's the best. The inventory is constantly changing. Um, so just look, find the, the right house with a great deal. Um, and then get a really good realtor who can negotiate a great deal for you. We know some. Yeah. So ask us. Okay. And then we want to talk about lenders that help you push to win. So there's a lot of different ways that lending can change. Um, oh, that reminds me. I had one other thing to talk about. I saw an article this morning that compared today's housing market with 2008s. I know. What did it say? That was my thought exactly. Well, I was like, wow, this is a real inflammatory headline. <laughs> Let's just see what they have to back this up. And their only point in the entire article was that the percentage of new home sales compared to the percentage of resale home sales is the same. I was like, that is like so off base. Wait, what was the inflammatory headline? That today's market was similar to 2008's market. 
I was like, that's crazy. Oh, because that's right before the housing crash. Yes. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I was like, this is crazy. So what the article is not talking about is that there was a massive surplus of homes in 2006, 7, 8. And where was this article published? I don't remember. See, this is a good point to keep in mind, my friends. Where did the article come from? Yeah. Look at your sources and think critically about them. <laughs> um, but anyway, yeah. Massive surplus of homes in 2008. Major shortage of homes in 2024. Four million homes short, possibly as high as 7.2 million. Um, and on top of that, they were handing out predatory loans like candy in 2006. And now it's a whole financial colonoscopy to get a loan. So the parallels from today's market in 2008 are literally non-existent. No. That was just fake news. So watch out for fake news. But anyway. Um, <laughs> Thank you for that tangent. I know, sorry. Um, sorry, not sorry. <laughs> okay, so anyway, that all that to say, guidelines are constantly changing. Sometimes things come up where you just need a creative lender that can help get the deal closed. So yeah, tell us a story about this. Yeah, I have two stories. So the guidelines just changed. The government guidelines just changed for condo, HOA, insurance policy. I'm not going to get super into it, but um, anyway, they lowered the reco- the max deductible. And so now some condos are having a hard time getting finance through government things. And every once in a while you're like, mm, could a l- another lender just push it through? Like, no, that is the guideline. There's no getting around it. Believe me, I called Fannie Mae and I was like, can you grandfather us in? Because this was so the master insurance recently. policy, the HOA has a new requirement on how much insurance, how what their deductible has to be. The HOA, not your individual condo owner, what insurance they need to have. The HOA of the entire development has to have a master insurance policy with a certain deductible. And if they don't, none of the condos are going to be financeable. Yep. So this is where it's like, okay, a lender that will push to help you win. I went to the HOA meeting. Oh my and, gosh. I know you did that. Oh yeah. <laughs> and I advocated and I was like, here's the guidelines. Let me tell you all about it. And this is going to be a problem for all your sellers, blah, blah, blah. Um, all that to say they didn't pull it together. But, <laughs> but we do have a success story because sometimes you can push something to another lender. So we just see the deal on, um, and those clients did find another condo and it's all good with the happy ending. But we just saved a deal that another lender blew up because the property was in the wrong thermal zone or had been moved, whatever. Um, we you came. Next. Yeah. We came. We got it closed in like less than two weeks. No problem. We saved the day. So all that to say is like you need a creative lender who will push and do whatever it takes to get the deal done. And not every lender is going to go to the HOA meeting before they tell you, no, it's really not doable. Because so that means if they said no, it might be doable somewhere else. Yep. But if Sandy we'll tells you no, look at it. then it's really no. Yeah. That's what I took away from that story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, we have the grand opening party for some new housing. Speaking of development here in Reno, 18 on Lakeside. On Friday night, we have our grand opening from 4 to 7. Now you're thinking, Shivani, you planned an event on Friday night. I did. I did plan an event on Friday night, and it's going to be fun. You needed something to do with your kids on Friday night anyways. And you know what else you need? A Christmas card photo. And I am going to have a Christmas backdrop that Michelle makes, not me, because you guys know I'm not good at making anything pretty. You can have full faith. She is good at it. It's going to be very nice. And we have a professional photographer who will take your family picture, and you will be done. You will have your Christmas card ready to go at the beginning of November ahead of schedule. We have tours of the show home while your kids can do arts and crafts. We have a food truck coming, free food, free booze. Come hang out with us on Friday night. And in closing today on a very special episode of Property Pursuits, I want to tell you something. If a twice impeached convicted felon can be elected, re-elected president on the grounds of being a strong businessman after filing for bankruptcy four times, Anything is possible. The world is your oyster and you too can buy a home.